Well, it's a privilege to be able to share God's word with you tonight and uh, grow together in this way. Please open up to 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 21 to 25. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 21 to 25. This is God's word. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they held their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to come. We thank you that you were willing to die in our place and bear the wrath of God for us. We thank you for this time at Easter where we can remember your death, the suffering you went through, and as well your glorious resurrection. And we thank you that you have done this on our behalf. We pray at this time that you would really help us to see clearly what you have done, to cherish all that you have done for us, and to see it in a new light, even at this time, God. And we just pray for it right now to burn in us, that you would burn in us your love and what you have done, and as well convict us with your word, Challenge us by your word. Pierce us with it, God. We need this. And we pray right now that you would be doing it in all of us and even in me too. And I pray it all for your glory. Amen. Well, this weekend we remember Jesus' death and that he was buried, but as well that he rose with joyful triumph and conquered sin and death. What a wonderful hope we have as Christians. But tonight, I won't be doing a sermon focused on Jesus' resurrection, because in a couple of weeks, we'll be continuing on in our series in John, and we'll have several sermons on his death and resurrection. So instead, tonight, I want us to look at another death that was happening at Jesus' death. Jesus' death wasn't the only death that happened on the cross as he died, And verse 24 in our passage will show us this, and it is where we will focus our time tonight. But first, let's look at the verses that lead up to this. Verse 21, it begins and says, To this you were called, and it's referring to unjust suffering. The the previous verse shows us this. And this is really the call for all Christians, not just the servants that Peter is addressing in verse 18 to 20. And the reason that we are called to this is because our Savior has suffered unjustly so that we follow in his steps. He went to the cross and suffered. People hurled insults at him and he had done nothing to deserve deserve any of it. But he didn't retaliate. He was silent as he suffered for the sin of those who believe. He did this firstly for you to bear your sin, to bear our sin, but it was also as an example so that we follow him. This was part of Christ's purpose in dying. Jesus suffered so that we would follow in his footsteps, not revile, not retaliate and curse when we suffer. And verse 24, the verse we want to focus on, further explains this. It says, 1 Peter 2 verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Let's pause there. What does this mean? When we say that Jesus bore our sins, we are saying that his body faced the full force of what our sins deserve so that we would not have to. Dwell on that. Think on that. He bore and carried all our sins, all your sins, that were deserving of the full wrath of, of God. It was like a raging torrent of God's anger was coming for us 
and should have come upon us, but it all went on Christ. And he bore the full force of that raging torrent of God's anger. That's what he did when he bore our sins. He bore our sin and he was able to do this because verse 22 just said, he committed no sin. And isn't it interesting how we saw there at the beginning of verse 24 that it is on a tree that he does this. It was at a tree where the fall began and now it is on a tree where the effects of the fall are put to an end for those who believe. Maybe it's to really show how Jesus is taking our place, bearing our sin for absolutely everything that we did wrong, even back to the fall. We see this all throughout the Bible, that Jesus bore our sins. And in doing this, he bore our sins to do so many things. He bore our sins to remove the punishment we deserve, to remove the condemnation that was upon us, to remove God's wrath, to give us his righteousness. He bore our sins to provide us the forgiveness of sin. Jesus' death has, has brought us salvation because of all of this. But his death also brings something else in our lives. In his death, another death happened. It was ours. Jesus died that we might die to sin. 1 Peter 2, 24, have a look again. The verse goes on, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. Do we realize this about Jesus' death? Yes, he died to provide the forgiveness of sin and show God's great love. But he also died so that you would die to sin and live for righteousness. You see, we also died at Jesus' death. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says, says, We have been united with Christ in his death. At his death, we died and we died to sin. Jesus' death brought death to sin and all its consequences, yes, but also it is to bring death to the ongoing work and power of sin in our lives. Now let's quickly just make sure we see the connections in this verse, in, in verse 24. It begins saying, Jesus bore our sin. Why? Why did he do that? Well, then it says, so that, and in the original, this phrase is clearly showing the purpose of why he bore our sins. Why did he do it? What was the purpose? That we die to sin and live for righteousness. And verse 21 has already had a similar idea. It's just said, Jesus suffered for you that you should follow in his steps. Now, this isn't works salvation as it is. His, is his dying for you that allows you to live like this. Him bearing our sins enables us to die to sin and live for righteousness. The point of this verse, verse 24, is clear and simple. Jesus died so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness in our lives. What does it mean to die to sin? Living for righteousness can seem quite clear, what does it mean to die to sin? And this is where I want us to focus more. Well, it means that our old self, that loved sin, dies as Jesus dies. We are no longer dominated by sin and all its attractions because we have died to sin in Jesus' death. We now hate sin. It is our enemy. And we love and long for righteousness and for God's ways that is what it is to die to sin. So ask yourself, are you living in a way that shows Jesus' death to be effective? Is his death achieving that purpose in your life? Are you showing that Jesus' death is a reality in your life because you die to sin and live for righteousness? This must be the case for the Christian. This must be happen in them. But why? We need to see why this must be the case, because some will argue this away and say it isn't important in the Christian life. Why is dying to sin so important and living to righteousness so important for the Christian? 
Well, because Jesus demands it. Jesus' death demands it. Maybe you are thinking, Jesus loves me. It doesn't matter if I fall into sin because he has forgiven me. This can be a deadly mentality. Dying to sin, it is essential for the Christian. How can I say that? Isn't a trust in Jesus' death essential? Well, yes, it is. But a trust in his death will bring about our dying to sin. Trust in his death is essential, but our dying to sin is something that our trust in his death should bring. God sent his son to die so that we die to sin. God bought this with the blood of Jesus. And so that work cannot fail in us. But also, why is dying to sin or living a righteous life so important for the Christian? It's because we also are told as Christians to put sin to death. There are many calls in Scripture for the the Christian to put sin to death because that is our old self. And instead, put on righteousness. The Christian should have it high on their priority list to do this. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 says, put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. But as well, why is dying to sin so important? It's because it proves that we are children of God. Romans 8 verse 13 to 14 says, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Those who put to death sin are sons of God because it shows they are led by the Spirit. But as well, dying to sin is essential for the Christian because it shows if God is working in us. Romans 8, it's just shown us that if we are dying to sin, It is showing that the Spirit is working in us. If we are dying to sin and living righteously, God is doing that in us. He's working in us. And that is why it is essential for the Christian. But the Bible gives us more reasons why we must die to sin as Christians. It's also because God's God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Titus 2 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. The salvation that we have, God's grace that we have received, teaches us to say no to sin. That's why we must die to sin. But also, we must die to sin as Christians because Christ died to redeem for himself a people zealous for good works. Titus 2 Verse 13 says, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Christ died to redeem us and free us from sin. How could we run back to it? How could we run to doing what nailed Christ to the cross again and again? Don't run to the things that he died for and redeemed us from. Every time that we sin, we are saying that Christ's death doesn't really matter. This week I was talking to someone about some of these things. And and as we were talking about these things and he was thinking some similar things, he said this phrase, he said, you do not celebrate Christ's death if you don't die to sin. And it is so true. We do not celebrate Christ's death now at Easter if we don't die to sin. Instead, if we don't die to sin, we are saying that he shouldn't have bothered redeeming us from our sin. That's what you are saying if you don't die to sin because you still love it. You still pursue it and you think it's good. Romans chapter 6 verse 2 says, We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? How can we, as God's 
redeem people live in it any longer. But finally, why is dying to sin so important for the Christian? A final reason is because a failure to die to sin puts us in danger of God's wrath. Sin will destroy us if it is not destroyed in our lives and if it's not put to death. Colossians 3 verse 5 to 6 say these weighty things. It says, put to death Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. God's message is clear. Put to death sin, because his wrath is coming on these things. God's wrath is coming. So this is why we must die to sin. And it is so important that we die to sin at this time. We are in a time right now where sin may become rampant in our lives if it is left unchecked. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 gives insight into this time and it says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We are in a dangerous time at the moment, and we are more susceptible to being hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And we need to realize this. As Christians, we need daily encouragement, else we may turn from the living God, because we have a sinful, unbelieving heart that is hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Hebrews gives us this warning. Sin is deceptive. And God tells us, that as, tells us that as Christians, we need others around us. We need each other. But we are in a time where this is hard to have. We don't have the encouragement that we would normally have. We don't have the people to keep a check on us and on our sin and to help us endure in the faith. So we really need to be on guard at this time. And we need to seek ways where we can still have this fellowship. As we live under the restrictions that we do, we are in a time where sin could grow more and more and more. We are in a time where idleness is going to creep in. And 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us to warn the idle. We're in a time where laziness is going to show its ugly head. Distrust in God and anxiety will grow. Selfishness is going to be fueled in this time. And we have seen it. In the news, patience and gentleness are going to be tested as anger and frustration take over, and people's mouths are going to insult and revile and curse. Sin will creep into our lives, sin will creep into our words and how we treat people. Sin will creep in as we spend all day long with the same people. And as well, in this time, we will fill our lives. With emptiness, we will be tempted to fill our lives with junk all day with frivolous entertainment in movies or endless scrolling in the socials. We need to not waste away this time. And also a final way that this time could have sin rampant in our lives is deep and destructive habits could form as people are away from the accountability that they need. If ever there was a time when we needed to die to sin, it is now as Christians. It is now. It's urgent. Sin is going to be rampant in this time. So what will help us die to sin and live for righteousness as Jesus' death calls for us to do, as we're seeing in this verse? I don't want to just leave you having told you that you need to die to sin and live for righteousness. I want you to see the help that God's word gives us to die to sin. And as I go through God's word for myself, I see several things that help me put sin to death. And so here I have seven strategies to help battle sin, and they apply to so many sins. Today I was just thinking through different sins in my life and how these strategies battle these things and help me fight these sins. And so may they do this for you as well and help you battle sin. And to remember them, I have summarized them under the 
acronym mortify so that we can remember them as the, the moment of temptation strikes. And that word mortify, I love because it's an old word that means to crush, destroy, and put something to death. And that is what the Christian must do to their sin. They must mortify it. So how do we die to sin? What do we need to do? Well, the first thing we actually need to do is make sure we are saved. To have any chance of fighting sin, you need to be a Christian because when we are saved, we are a new creation with a new heart, new desires, God's law written on our hearts. Ezekiel 36, 2 Corinthians 5, many passages show this. The only thing that is going to give us power to die to sin is the fact that Christ first suffered for you and your sin and that he is now with you. The only way we are able to fight sin is if we are saved through God's power and if his power is continuing to work in us, which Christ has made possible in his death. But also, we must make sure we are saved because if we are saved, there is a call on us to be who we are. We are God's children if we are saved. We are a new creation and we are to be like this. We are to live like this. We were in sin, and now we are to put on God's righteousness. The Christian needs to be who they are. And if we aren't living like this, it is eternally serious. We need to think like this. The Bible talks about our sin like this and puts a heavy weight on our sin, and this helps us fight. If we are truly God's children, yes, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. But when we sin and turn from God, it should make us examine if we have his love, if we have experienced it. When we sin, we must make sure we are saved. When sin strikes, the first step is to examine your life, to see whether you're in the faith, as 1 Thessalonians 5 says. And when you do this, you will see your hopeless state before God and your need to be saved. It will remind you that you cannot save yourself. You will see that your only hope is Christ bearing your sin and trusting in him for that. But also, Christ's death, as we've been seeing, purchased the power to die to sin. And so we must realize that an ongoing unrepentant sin in our lives will show that Christ has not bore our sin because he bore our sin that we might die to it. And he makes us a new creation and gives us his spirit that we might die to it. So make sure you're saved to help you in the battle to fight sin. Secondly, how do we die to sin? We need to open our eyes to the dangers of sin. Sin is deceptive. It promises something good, but it only leads to death, as Proverbs 5 shows, and it leads to an eternity in hell, as Matthew 5 shows us. We must remember this about sin, and it will help us fight it. We need to see sin in all its ugliness. It should make us sick as we think about it, and that should help us and make us not want to go near it. And we need to pray that God would give us this view of sin, that he would open our eyes to the dangers of sin, that he would give us this perspective with the sins that we are struggling with, with the anger that we may be struggling with at the moment, or the selfishness, or the foul words that we may be using. We need to open our eyes to see the damage and danger of those things, the damage and danger of all of our sin. And when we see that, it should make us want to fight it and flee from it. Which brings us to the next point. How do we die to sin? Thirdly, we need to run from sin and remove whatever causes us to sin. Again and again in the Bible, it tells us to run from temptation and to get rid of whatever causes us to sin. 1 Timothy 6, 1 Corinthians 6, show us this. To fight sin, we need to determine not to sin and say no straight away, and we need to flee. 
And if something causes you to sin, the Bible shows us we need to cut it off. Get rid of it no matter how precious it may be to you. Matthew 5, we see that. We need to be fierce in our assault on sin. And the reason is because it is better to enter eternal life limbless than go to hell whole. Mark 9 shows us. It is better to cut off your leg in a sense Or it is better to cut off that prized possession that you love, that prized sin, and have life than go to hell with everything. Mark 9 shows us that sin puts us in the danger of hell and we should do all that it takes to battle it, to cut it off. Fourthly, How do we die to sin? We need to tell God and others about sin, about our struggles. We need to ask for God to remove the temptation and the struggle that we are facing. We need to pray that he would remove those illicit desires. We need to confess our failures to him. We need to seek for his forgiveness. And when we do that, when we confess our sin to God, when we seek for his forgiveness, this reminds us of the seriousness of sin, that we have sinned against God, as David sees in Psalm 51, and that will help us fight it. But also we need to tell others, we need to confess our sins to each other, as James 5 verse 16 tells us. We need to pray for each other. We need to seek accountability from those who care for our soul. And we need help. We need the help. We need help from other people to wage war on sin. So be open with others. Tell God about your sin. Confess your sin to him and seek his forgiveness. And tell others to help wage war on sin. Fifthly, how do we die to sin? We need to instill God's truth into our minds. We need to remember here that God's ways are best and the shortcuts of sin offer no lasting satisfaction. We need to instill his promises into our mind. You need to fix your eyes on Christ, on his promises, until the sinful thought, the desire, that temptation is gone. Fill your mind, as Philippians 4 says, with things that are pure and right. The mind is a powerful thing, and we must renew it with God's truth to have a transformed life, as we see in Romans 12, verse 2. Another verse that that shows this and how we need to instill God's truth into our mind, and one that I love, is Psalm 119, verse 9, which says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. And verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need to learn how to fight sin according to God's word. We need to remember the truth of the dangers of sin through God's word, like passages in passages like Proverbs chapter 5, 6, and 7. And as well, we need to remember the truth of how Christ has died to set us free from sin. And this will help us fight as we instill God's word into our minds, as we meditate on his word, as we memorize it, and as we use it to fight, as we use the strategies that it gives us to fight sin and put it to death. Number six, what must we do to die to sin Well, you need to fill your life with beneficial things. Satan has a field day with temptation and tempting us with sin when we are idle or in vulnerable circumstances. So we must fill our lives with good things, not idleness, for we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2.10 says. And when temptation strikes... When sin is at the door, we need to go 
and do some beneficial activity. We need to fill our lives with profitable situations, with people that help us, with activities and words and thoughts that are profitable for us. We need to fill our time with knowing Christ and with advancing his kingdom. Because when we are idle, Satan will strike. So fill your life with beneficial things. And finally, what must we do to battle and fight sin? We must yearn for true satisfaction. Long for the satisfaction and hope that is found in Jesus. And pursue that with all your might. Long for that. Yearn for that. Remember the gospel that satisfies God's wrath that we should have faced, that provides forgiveness and and exterminates the flames of guilt that Satan wants to use on us to destroy us. Remember that Christ came to save sinners. He has carried our sin. He has bore our sin. And it's here in the gospel, here that we find lasting satisfaction and contentment, not in sin, but also see how God's good design is best, how his ways for satisfaction are best, how he can bring contentment. He loves us. He wants what's best. So wait on him for eternal pleasures, for the kingdom to come, not in the pleasures of sin. And now, all too often, sin is driven in us by a hope and trust in this life. Sin is driven in us because we hope in this life. So we must yearn for true satisfaction in the gospel and what in, and in what is to come. Well, may we use these things to put sin to death. May we use the strategies God gives us to put sin to death, to mortify our sin. Don't let your fight of sin be so weak. Don't let it be weak as it is for so many because they don't see what is at stake. They they think it doesn't matter because Jesus died and because of that I have forgiveness no matter what. But oh, how we are wrong to think like that. Jesus died so that we die to sin. And Jesus' death enables you to die to sin. Don't think that you can say, Jesus died for me and not die to your sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 has shown us that these things go together. Our dying to sin and living for righteousness was part of the purpose in Christ bearing our sin. And yes, realize that we won't fully die to sin in this life. The presence of sin will be completely gone one day when we're with Christ in glory. But the Christian will in this life long to die to sin and pursue that death to sin. And also be sure to battle sin, remembering that the battle against sin has been won by Christ at the cross. He has freed us from the penalty of sin but also the ongoing power of sin in our lives. We are saved by Christ and his death and resurrection. And we must remember that we cannot save ourselves by any work, by putting sin to death. Because verse 25 in our passage goes on to say, we are like sheep who have gone astray. We cannot get back to God on our own. We cannot cannot get ourselves on track. We will not seek God on our own. It is only, only by the wounds and sacrifice of Christ, our shepherd, that can bring us back to God. It is only by his death that we can be saved. 1 Peter 2, verse 24 to 25, the end of our passage, it says, it ends saying this, he himself Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree 
so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for this season to remember the death of Christ, to remember his resurrection and all that it has brought, what great benefits we have through Christ's death and resurrection, what great hope we have that is awaiting us one day. We thank you for this hope that we can have in a world that can seem pretty hopeless at times. And we thank you as well for your word that brings conviction and shows purpose for our lives. It shows, that shows the purpose to live for righteousness, to die to sin. We pray, God, that we would see and realize that you sent your son to die, to bear our sins for so many reasons, and one of them being that we would die to sin and live for righteousness. May you bring about that in us, God. May you work in us by your spirit to enable us to die to sin and live for righteousness, all for your glory. Amen.